Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, maximum number of operations to move ones to the end. So the idea is that we're given a string. So this is not an array. These are a bunch of characters. That's going to be important when we actually do like comparisons and stuff. And it's going to consist of ones and zeros. And what we can do in a single operation is pick any number that is a one, so any of these one locations, and basically we can keep taking that number and shifting it to the right until it hits another one. So basically the zeros are like free spaces. By shifting it here, we're basically swapping these two and then we can form another swap over here and then we'll end up with zero, zero, one. And that's the only operation we're allowed to do. So we could have done it on that or we could have done it on a different number. We could have done it on this one. And we're only allowed to do that for a number as long as there is at least one zero on the right of it. So this guy can move to the right by one. Uh, this guy cannot. There's nothing to the right of it. There's nobody to swap. This one, it can't move initially because there is a one over there. But if we're clever, we can choose to do this one first, which would give us a zero one. And then this one can be shifted to the right. And then we'd end up with, I think, zero one one. There's many different operations we can do. But what we want to do is return the maximum number of operations we can perform. So it turns out that the order that we do these in does matter. Can you figure out which order would be the best to maximize the number of operations? Well, I think it's pretty intuitive to figure it out. I mean, maybe not if you're a beginner, but you can kind of just look at this example and just think about it. Like we have choices. We could do this one first. I mean, we really only have two choices. We can do this one or this one. Does it matter which order we do it in? And if it's not obvious to you right now, I'll just go through the example and then by the end of it, it probably will be. What if we decided to do this guy first? Okay, well then we'll get zero, one. That's one operation. And then we could do this one next. And then we would get, I think one, one, and then the zero would be over here. And then the only choice left for us is gonna be the one over here. And then we'll push it all the way to this spot. And then there'll be a one over here and this guy will be zero. So that was three operations. But what if we did it the other way? What if we started with this guy? Well, then we would have pushed it all the way over here. And just by looking at this picture, we know that's not the terminal position of this one because we know that as long as there's some gaps over here, as long as all the ones are not contiguously connected, we know there are still operations for us to perform. And in fact, if we see a zero over here and there are three ones contiguously to the left, that gives us three additional operations for us to do because we're gonna end up putting the one over here, then we're gonna put a, uh, the one over here, and then finally we're gonna put that last one over there. So that was three operations plus the first one that we did, so there's four total operations. So that helps us build the intuition that, look, just by looking at this, I can say, that I would want to be greedy in the sense that I want to prioritize the elements that are all the way to the left because there's either two cases. Either the ones over here are already contiguous. So maybe we have something like this where there's three contiguous ones, in which case we push this guy over there and then there's really nothing left for us to do. Or there could have been the case which we did have over here. Yes, we take this one and we push it over here, but if there are additional holes over there, we'll be able to have the opportunity to push this guy again. So the reason we prioritize the elements that are on the left first is because it gives us the greatest chance of having multiple uh, sections for us to push. But if we did it in the opposite order, if we did these first, we're closing those gaps. We're telling this one, well, there were two opportunities for you to go, but now there's only one. We closed the opportunity. We don't wanna do that. So that's kind of the intuition. And there's multiple ways to actually implement the algorithm once you figure out that intuition. One is by scanning from left to right. I think that's visually more intuitive for most people. There's another way, which I kind of prefer, but I feel like most people aren't going to prefer it, which is iterating in reverse order. I'll just go over the intuition of both of them and show that to you. So the way going from left to right is straightforward conceptually. I think the code is a little bit more annoying because we're going to need nested loops. So here we're going to iterate. We're going to have a pointer. Once we see a one, 
we're not going to necessarily immediately start shifting it because we could run into a case like over here where we have a one and then there's another one to the right of it. So in that case, we can't really shift. But what we are definitely going to do is keep track of the count of ones because maybe they're contiguous. Maybe over here we'd had three ones and maybe we had like five ones over here. But as soon as we see the zero, then we know, okay, we had five ones and we see a zero. So now that means we can perform five operations by shifting all of them. Uh, let's keep track of the ones. So right now we're gonna have a single one and then our eye pointer is gonna be over here. And this is the case where we see a zero. So that's good. And we're gonna keep track of our result, which is the number of operations initially that's zero. But what we're gonna do here now is while the element at our current position is zero, we're going to keep incrementing the pointer. So we want to basically say this one is gonna be shifted. We don't actually have to perform the shift. We don't have to update the input string. We just have to keep track of the count of operations. So we're gonna increment i to be over here, increment i to be over here then. And this is where it's gonna stop. And since we encountered some zeros, we would take whatever our count of ones is and we would add that to the result, which is gonna be one. Okay, so now here we see a second one. So we don't do anything to the result, but we do increment the number of ones. We have two now. Once again, I is shifted. We see a third one. We increment the count of ones. It's gonna be three now. Now we see a zero. So we're gonna keep shifting until we're done with the zeros. I is gonna be over here. We're gonna take three add it to uh, the result, which is gonna be four total. So we have a one now, we can increment the count of ones, it's gonna be four, but we don't see any zeros after that, so it's not like we can actually shift these any further. So our result for this problem is gonna be four. That's, I think, a perfectly fine way to do it. I encourage you to try to code that up yourself. I think if you understood this explanation, you have a decent chance of being able to do that. But I think the other case, the other solution I wanna show you, which is kind of just inverting the idea of the problem a little bit, we're gonna iterate through this in reverse order because what I can say is instead of keeping track of the ones, I can keep track of the zeros. And the reason that's gonna be useful is because of this. I'm gonna iterate from right to left. I see a one, I don't do anything. Well, I mean, in some cases we are gonna do something. I'll show you what's gonna happen. But okay, now I'm gonna see a zero. I set this to one because logically what I'm gonna do is say, okay, I had one hole over here. So that means every time I see a one value, I can take the count of zeros and add it to the result. Because we have a hole over here, that means this guy can be shifted by one, not because there's one zero, but because there's a segment of zeros here. So that can be shifted by one, and then this can be shifted by one again. So this will end up being two, and then we'll see a zero again. So when we see the zero, we know this is a new segment, and I guess the reason we would know that is because we would compare this guy to the value on the right. If the previous value is also a zero, then we know that this is not a new segment. But since the previous value is a one, we know it is a new segment. So I would set now the count of a zero. Uh, the result is still two. The count of zero will now be incremented to two because this is our second zero segment. And we don't update the result quite yet because it's when we see a one that we would update the result. So now our pointer is gonna be shifted over here. We see that this is a zero, but we're not gonna increment the count of zeros because this is not a new segment. This is part of the same segment. So this stays the same. And then finally, uh, we get to one. Now we're gonna take count zeros and add that to the result. Why do we add that to the result? Because what it means logically is that for this one, there's a segment of zeros here and there's a segment of zeros here. So it can kind of be two hops to get this push all the way to the right. So that's the other way to do it. Both of them are linear time and constant space. I'm gonna code up the first one because I assume most people will find that one easier, but I'll show you the code for the second one as well. Okay, well, this is the code for the second one, but I will go ahead and do the first one like I promised. So we're gonna keep track of the one segments. Well, actually, it's not really one segments when we're going left to right, it's the count of ones. So initially I'll set that to zero. I will also set the result to zero, which is gonna keep track of the operations. And then we are going to iterate from left to right. And we're gonna do some nested stuff. So I'm actually gonna declare the pointer outside of it. And while I is in bounds, we are going to shift. So there's two main cases. The first case is really, really easy. If uh, S of I is equal to one. Well, we found 
a one, so we can increment the count of ones, but we cannot yet update the result because we don't know if there's actually any holes for us to push this towards. There's no zeros that we've seen yet necessarily. So that's what the else case is gonna be for. So the else case is this is a zero. Okay, so now we want to advance our pointer to the right as much as possible until we hit another one. So we're gonna say while s of i is equal to zero, go ahead and just increment the pointer. Well, one issue with this is this might go out of bounds. So let's just first ensure that this is in bounds and we can do that like this. Uh, but the other case is we definitely want to shift the pointer by one each time. Like we see that we're shifting the pointer here, but we're not necessarily shifting the pointer in this case. So we do need to put at least one increment operation out here. And that's gonna kind of mess with the logic over here because what this loop is gonna do is say, keep pushing the pointer until we reach a one. So we would want to count that one, but after this loop exits, we're gonna increment by one again. So can you tell me how we can fix this bug? Well, we can keep shifting until I plus one is no longer equal to zero. While it is equal to zero, so while I plus one is in bounds and then I plus one is equal to zero, then we're gonna increment. So that means our I pointer should stop at the last zero and then we'll increment one more time out here and then it'll be left at the last one. So we're almost done now. Um, I see one bug actually, I'm using the wrong name here. So let me just fix that. And the other thing is, when do we actually increment the result? I almost forgot to do that, I think. Well, every time we see a segment of zeros, so when this else case executes, we definitely want to increment the result and we wanna do it by however many ones we have seen. So you can do that either before the loop or after the loop. It doesn't really change anything because result and one count don't really change within this loop. So there's the final code and I'll go ahead and run this now. And you can see here it works. It's pretty efficient. I know this uh, runtime is pretty random. I guess just out of curiosity, I'll show you the previous one, which does not have nested loops, but I don't think that necessarily means it's actually faster. They're still both the same complexity, but I'll run this as well. And you can see that's like about the same. Anyways, if you found this helpful, check out Neatcode.io for a lot more, and I'll see you guys soon.